I'm Christina Raab, President and CEO of the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. I'm delighted to welcome Institute Board Member Paul Anastas to our 5 in 10 series. Paul is a former Assistant Administrator of the US Environmental Protection Agency for Research and Development appointed by President Barack Obama. And he concurrently served as the EPA Science Advisor from 2010 to 2012. Paul now serves as the Theresa and H. John Hines third professor in the practice of chemistry for the environment at Yale University. In addition, he is the director of the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering at Yale. Widely known as the father of green chemistry, Paul has published over a dozen books on the science and engineering of sustainability. He is also the co-founder of P2 Science, which develops and brings sustainable chemistry to market. Paul, I'm honored to have you join us for this conversation today. Well, Christina, the, the honor is all mine, and thank you so much for having me. This is a real pleasure. Really looking forward uh, to our conversation. Uh, first, for those who are less familiar with this field, what is green chemistry? And how can it be used to address the human and environmental impacts of consumption and production? So it's a wonderful question. You know, many times when people hear the word chemistry, they're thinking about some course they took in secondary school or, or a particular industry. But we know that, that chemistry and chemicals are everything that we see, touch, and feel. And that chemistry has absolutely revolutionized quality of life and length of life over the past 100 years or more. But we also know that various types of chemistry and, and chemical products have often caused harm of different types, um, pollution, toxicity. And green chemistry is simply about how you design the products and processes of chemistry so that you reduce or elim eliminate the use and generation of hazardous substances. It's simply saying that you get all of the benefits of our consumer products, our um, products that drive our society and our economy, and do it in ways that are sustainable and conducive to life. Mm -hmm. And um, the topic of circular economy is at the forefront of many debates uh, these days. Governments and businesses are really increasingly taking action to implement a circular economy. How can green chemistry help to drive this transition? So, you know, green chemistry is always looking at people with uh, often very good intentions can try to do the right things and do them wrong. What green chemistry is looking at is how do you do the right things right? In other words, using the example of a circular economy, it's a wonderful, powerful concept, right? It is looking at nature as a mentor and saying that in, in nature, there is no waste. And every time a waste would be generated in nature, an organism would evolve to consume it. And it uses that, of course, as a, uh, as a model for our industrial systems. Now, one of the things that we have to recognize is that while a circular economy is of great benefit in many different circumstances, there are others that we may want to be very thoughtful about. So when we look at nature as a model, we have to recognize that with the exception of sunlight, the earth is a closed system. And so uh, our industrial processes are not. So when we implement a circular economy, we have to do it thoughtfully. So when it makes sense to have our materials and our energy in a, in a cycle for a circular economy, we have to make sure that the inherent nature of those materials is positive and safe for people in the biosphere. If we wanted to introduce hazardous, persistent, 
toxic materials and put them in a circular economy, that makes no sense, right? So green chemistry is looking at the inherent nature of our materials and designing it so that it's going to not cause hazard, adverse consequence to humans and, and, and the biosphere. Mm -hmm. So that is what green chemistry is all about. It's about design because sometimes it's going to make sense for, for harmless substances to go in a continuous um, cycle. Other times, such as things that are going to be diffused into the environment because of the nature of their use, um, other things that are going to be degraded back into nature, that those things need to be designed so that they can also go back into nature without any problems. So that's what green chemistry is all about, is thoughtful design about the inherent properties of our chemicals that give us all of our consumer products so that they're not harmful. And you have been leading the green chemistry wave for more than two decades as an innovator, as a researcher, as a professor. What role must science and academia play in making all chemistry green chemistry? Well, uh, yes, you're very kind. It's actually sadly been close to three decades. So I, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm very old at this point. But uh, yeah, the truth of the matter is that you're right. The goal of green chemistry from the beginning has been that the, the whole words green chemistry go away because it is just simply the way that we do chemistry and the way we make our chemicals. And with all of the wonderful examples around the world in literally every sector of the economy that I can name, we're seeing great green chemistry achievements. It is still not systematic it is still not just the way that we do things. It is still the exception to the rule. And so in order for that to change and become just the way that we do business, yes, the scientific community and academia will have to train every practitioner of chemistry, the principles of green chemistry and how to do that. It's just um, quite frankly, simply the the way that every other discipline does things. I mean, every um, every architect and engineer knows that you're not going to uh, build a building without um, first ensuring that it's it's safe for occupancy. Every uh, every car designer knows that you have to make a car that's not going to fall apart. Every chef knows that you're going to make your delicious meals so that they're not poisonous. Every chemist every molecular scientist needs to know the principles of green chemistry so that they not only carry out their primary function, whether it's a, a glue or a dye or whatever it is, but also that they're not going to cause harm to human health and the environment. So that's what science and academia have to um, step up and make sure happens. But in order for green chemistry and all of its inventions and all of its discoveries to go to scale at the time frame that it needs to, we're also going to need participation from communicators, journalists, capital investors, uh, virtually all sectors to make these things into a reality. Mm -hmm. And as a follow on, where do you see the most powerful opportunities for innovation in green chemistry and product design? So it's interesting because people ask, can, can you reduce waste using green chemistry? And I say, absolutely. Can you make a process more efficient? And I say, absolutely. Is that where green chemistry ends? Absolutely not. I mean, mm -hmm. that's where green chemistry begins. I mean, certainly we can take things as they are and make them better. But, you know, doing the thing you're doing more efficiently doesn't make it a better thing, right? Doesn't help you do a better thing. So the real power and potential of green chemistry is when you have transformative innovation. So the past 25, 30 years of green chemistry have really demonstrated their power by filling up not only the scientific journals, but also brand new companies with new products 
new manufacturing processes, new transformations that help not simply for bottom line growth, but for top line growth, new products. Um, and that's where the, the real excitement around green chemistry is, because in addition to getting rid of the hazards and the pollution and things like that, now you can get new performance, new function um, from, uh, from green chemistry. And Paul, to conclude, um, can you paint us your vision for our planet and society by 2050? Yes, let's see. Uh, I guess it would probably be three things. One, that it's, um, you know, helpful rather than toxic, uh, renewable rather than depleting, restorative rather than degrading. So simply by using um, thoughtful design, um, we, we can accomplish these things. It's, uh, you know, I often say that we've done things so wrong for so long, we've got nothing but opportunities. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, just addressing some of the, the current absurdities and doing so in a way that is, you know, exciting and <laughs> quite frankly, the ethical thing to do. Great. Uh, thank you, Paul, for sharing this vision with us and for being with us today and for this very insightful conversation. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine.